thanks so much to True Leaf Market who've been backing on the ledge for the last three months. I'm really grateful for their support. This Utah-based seed company is helping gardeners grow, offering an incredible range of flower, vegetable and herb seeds, plus microgreens, mushroom growing kits and all kinds of other cool stuff. So why not support On The Ledge by giving True Leaf Market a try? US listeners, you get 10% off your first purchase at trueleafmarket.com now using the code ONTHELEDGE. Why not sow some change in your garden with an order from True Leaf Market? Their products come with a 30-day satisfaction guarantee, so I know you won't be disappointed. So remember, get 10% off your first purchase at trueleafmarket.com now using the code on the ledge. Hello and welcome to episode 102 of On The Ledge podcast. I am your host, Jane Perrone, and I'm hoping this is going to be a spine tingling episode. Well, if not a spine tingling episode, then maybe a skin tingling episode. Because this week we're talking about the king of the houseplant pests. The tiny king, because you can't see it with your naked eye. But nonetheless, the red spider mite has to be one of the most annoying and hard to treat pests on your indoor plants. Particularly those of the Maranta group, the Calatheas, Tenanthes, Stromants and so on. And in this episode, I'm going to talk to two expert entomologists about the life cycle and habits of these crazy creatures, explain what signs to look for when you think your plants have been infected, and of course, how to treat them. And I'm answering a question about easy trailing plants for cat-filled households. Congratulations this week to Nikki Knife in South Africa, who was the winner of the Mother Grow Light competition that we ran in episode 100. Well done, Nikki. Your Grow Light is spinning its way to you now, and I really hope you enjoy using it and get loads of pleasure from it. Nikki was so excited when I emailed with the news. So well done to you and thank you to everybody who entered. I got some lovely messages along with your entries, which was really nice. And it was great to hear from you all. And thanks for all the lovely feedback on episode 101 on spider plants. Yes, I know. Spider plants to spider mites from the sublime to the ridiculous. Ha! Huh, that's what we like to do here on On The Ledge podcast. Welcome to Lisa, Leah and Rod, who are all legends this week. That's because they've signed up for the $5 tier of my Patreon. And not only can they download an exclusive digital artwork, they can also listen to 30 episodes of An Extra Leaf, the additional mini podcast that I put out for Patreon subscribers of $5 a month or more. And this week they can enjoy me talking about three books that have inspired me, all with a planty theme, although not directly about house plants. And they can hear an extended interview with one of the entomologists in today's show about the crazy world of mites. And I'll also be adding an extra leaf episode on my adventures with caladiums in the next few days. So if you're not a Patreon subscriber and you want to be, check out the show notes at janeperone.com to find out how. Yes, it is in dollars, but you can use any form of currency you like to pay for it. So don't worry if you're outside the US. We welcome everybody US and otherwise. spider mites. If the mere mention of the name does not immediately set your teeth on edge, then you haven't experienced the true horror of a full-on spider mite infestation. The first time spider mites come to visit, you probably won't realise until your plants are looking pretty miserable. The trouble with these tiny creatures is they take up residence without us noticing and hang around doing damage before we know they're there. 
And even after you've treated a plant, they can come back for more when you least expect it. So I thought I'd start this episode by going on a little tour of my own house plants, checking for any spider mite evidence. Apologies in advance if it's a little bit noisy because we're having some building work done today, but I couldn't delay because I needed to go on a hunt for spider mites. Or in other words, let's all go on a mite hunt. Those of you without children may not get that reference, but anyway, uh, we're gonna look at my plants and see if there are any spider mites in evidence. And my guess is that there will be because spider mites are everywhere. So I'm gonna go over here and have a look at my little mini windowsill of Maranta group plants. I've got three up here. I've got a Tenanthi and a Calathea macoyana and a Calathea mosaica. Now I know that the Tenanthi has had spider mite in the past, so I think this is probably the number one suspect. And it, it just seems to be particularly vulnerable. And if you're looking at a Maranta group plant and you want to have an idea of how vulnerable it will be to spider mite, my well, ex experiential learning uh, has found that the more papery and thin the leaves, the more likely it is that it will suffer from spider mite. So the mosaic calathea, calathea mosaica, just seems to have thicker, more leathery leaves that don't seem so prone to infection. And looking at this plant, it's a, I love this, the leaves on this are just incredible. It's almost like a barcode. This looks fine. It's clear, it's healthy, it's green. The undersides of the leaf are showing no signs of any kind of residue or dust that might be an indication of spider mite. And similarly, the peacock calathea, which is one that's coming back from uh, being abused. Um, I, bought, I was given it as a plant that's uh, been suffering a bit. So this one, even though it's only tiny and is has had some a difficult early life if we can put it that way it's got lots of leaf damage but it hasn't got the kind of damage that tells me it's spider mite so the leaf damage here is kind of browning to the edges which indicates lack of humidity but not the kind of mottled look that you tend to get with spider mite and looking at the tenanthi i can see that it has had some spider mite damage because particularly when you hold up the leaves to the light on the underside you can see it is mottled and that's where the sap is sucked from the plant by the spider mites. So I can see there's been damage and now I'm gonna have a really close look at the leaves to see if I can see any current spider mite infestation. You might not notice the backs of the leaves starting to develop this grainy stuff that is the spider mites and their eggs because it's really quite hard to spot unless you're looking for it. Um, but you may notice the overall plant, particularly with this Maranta group, just kind of starts to sink and droop and look miserable. And if that happens, always check for spider mite. In fact, check for spider mite anyway, because it's, it's so prevalent, especially at this time of year. And looking at this plant, I can see that it's, well, there's a tiny amount of evidence uh, of spider mite right at the point where the leaf blade, the lamina, meets the petiole, the leaf stem. There is a tiny amount of white stuff. And if I get my magnifying glass out, I can see that, yes, that is a tiny amount of spider mite damage. So I need to move this plant away from the others and treat it again. If you have a really severe infestation, you'll probably find that you get some webbing um, around the plants and the plants will start to collapse and look absolutely terrible and then you'll be absolutely sure what you're dealing with. I'm glad to say I've never had one go that far. I've always managed to stop it, but I do find that plants that have been infected and are naturally weakened then become very vulnerable to repeat infections so you've just got to keep checking those leaves and in the case of this plant because it's got quite a lot of leaves what i will probably do if i find any leaves that look seriously infested i'll just remove them wholesale right down from the bottom of the stem and otherwise other than that i will treat the plant uh, with some sb plant invigorator and generally give it lots of love and it should recover fairly quickly again but it's just an act of constant vigilance <laughs> so 
so that's my weekend of leaf wiping sorted out but let's find out a little bit more about the weird world of mites i managed to get not one but two entomologists to chat to me on this subject the first is jules howard author of death on earth adventures in evolution and mortality and columnist for the guardian and Andrew Salisbury, who is Principal Entomologist at the RHS. And the first thing that I want to know is, where is this mite from exactly? Is it an interloper that arrived in the UK on a shipment of plants? Or has it always been here? Over to Andrew Salisbury. Uh, almost certainly a glass raspberry spider mite hopped over on a plant. But by the time we started looking at these things and people started growing uh, plants more widely to become widespread. So its actual origins probably aren't well, that well known. So here's the thing about red spider mites and indeed the whole mite family. Surprising though it may be, we really don't know much about this group of invertebrates. They're kind of like a one of nature's best kept secrets. You know, there's loads of species. Every species is, is unique in its behaviours and its habitats and its niches. And to be honest, most people completely overlook them. So mites are, well, that's one of the many problems when we're trying to understand how to deal with mites as pests is there's just not enough scientists out there willing to look at tiny things. They're all out there studying lions and macaques and other animals like that, you know. So as Jules Howard just explained there, mites we don't know much about them. Fortunately, the glasshouse red spider mite, which is the pest that causes most, if not all, of the damage to your house plants, is one of the better studied mites. Why? Because it's of interest to the horticultural community and indeed the industry of horticulture to get this pest under control. Because after all, while having your precious plants covered in spider mites and looking miserable may only cause you emotional stress for professional growers of plants it really can impact on their livelihood so what do we know about tetranicus urticae commonly known as the glasshouse red spider mite or the two spotted spider mite each spider mite lives about four weeks and the females can lay about 10 or 20 eggs every single day. The larvae hatch anything from about three days to two weeks after they've been laid and they generally hang out on the underside of leaves and suck sap out of plant cells and that's why you get the mottled effect. That's where they've just sucked the life out of a cell and you're left with a very pale patch behind. Obviously this is all happening on a really small scale, hence the mottled effect. As the spider mites take hold, the leaf will get more and more pale until eventually it will die. But the rate of expansion of a spider mite infestation can really depend on the conditions in which the plants are kept, as Andrew Salisbury explains. It's often said that plants grown in particularly high temperatures in dry, overcrowded situations can be affected more badly than, than plants grown in sort of more humid, not quite so hot environments. Uh, so it's all a case, of, often a case, of, yeah, as you say, a war of attrition and trying to keep it sort of at a more acceptable level at a, and, and the numbers down so they're not actually damaging plants too much. Dry heat really is the perfect breeding ground for spider mites, which is why we really struggle at this time of year when some of our plants can undergo heat stress as temperatures get very high behind the glass in our homes. As we've already heard, spider mites can come in on plants that we've newly bought, which is why it's really important to not only examine every single plant that you bring into your home very, very carefully, but ideally also quarantine them away from your other plants for a few weeks before you introduce them to the gang, because that way you can make sure there's no pests in evidence. I have to admit, I don't do this every time, but I have paid the price in the past for not doing it. So if you can, if you've got the room to keep that quarantine area up and running please do although the only thing worth saying with spider mites is bear in mind that although they don't have wings they can actually float in through your window and indeed float from plant to plant if there happens to be a bit of a breeze from an open window or door yes these things are little ninjas mites are capable some species of blowing around in the wind um, particularly the species like spider mites 
spider mites that can make uh, silk. You know, they can make little sort of silk threads that catch the wind. And as you say, they fly around. And these animals are so prolific in terms of their breeding that these exponential increases they're capable of mean only, you know, one or two mites can lead to a whole infestation, you know, after 20 days or so. And one of the signs that you've got a really serious infestation is the site of the webbing. Spider mites aren't actually arachnids as such, so why do they produce this silky stuff? Back to Jules. I'm writing a book about insects at the moment, and you realise that a lot of these smaller insects do the same thing. It's basically a way for, if you're living, for instance, on a leaf or on the side of a tree, there is various things trying to attack and kill you. So, you know, fungal parasites are trying to get to you, bacteria, obviously other mites. So by producing a sort of line of silk everywhere they move, if they're running around, they make a complex sort of um, blanket of silk and it becomes a kind of protective barrier, basically, from the things that are trying to kill it. So a lot of colonies, because obviously, as you say, they're, they're, they're kind of interrelated very closely to one another. And, you know, they almost, it's, it's like cloning, you know. So that whole colony can get covered up with these um, patches of silk and it protects, it protects the babies. Gives the phrase high and mighty a whole nother meaning. Well, we'll be back with more on how to fix the spider mite problem after the break. But first, let's hear from our other sponsor this week. This week's On The Ledge is sponsored by Babbel, the language learning app that will have you speaking a new language with confidence. My absolute favourite holiday ever was visiting Umbria in Italy. We stayed in a hilltop hotel, which was absolutely gorgeous, set in the centre of an olive grove. Wow, it was an amazing trip, but I really wished during that trip that my Italian was better. People kept mistaking me for a local. It must have been my incredible sense of style. But anyway, I couldn't reply. I couldn't even say, I'm sorry, I don't know what you're saying. And that's why I'd like to improve my Italian language this summer. And the great thing about Babbel is it's designed to get you quickly speaking your new language within weeks. Babbel's teaching method has been proven to be effective across multiple studies and the lessons are really quick and convenient at just 10 to 15 minutes per session. And because the lessons are created by actual people rather than a machine, so you really are getting something that's been handcrafted and is tested and will work. You can try Babbel for free. Go to babbel.com or download the app and try it for free. That's babbel, B-A-B-B-E-L.com or download the app to try for free. Babbel. Speak a new language with confidence. In the battle against Tetranitis urticae, there are various weapons we can wield, but which of them really works? That's what we're going to find out next. Andrew Salisbury brings us the options. Yeah, on on the pesticide, there isn't really a great deal available which will uh, control the uh, control spider mites, and it, you are down to really things like the SB plant invigorators, the uh, plant oil based products, uh, fatty acid based products. Uh, neem oil might be recommended uh, for use in places like the states, but it's not registered for use in the UK, so we can't recommend that it that is used. It's not being tried, tested, uh, and registered for UK use. Um, uh, so really. It is using things like the plant oils, the fatty acid, the organic type of um, pesticide um, that that can help. Um, The systemic neonicotinoid, cetamoprid, is is also available. Uh, But of course, there are, you know, people do have concerns with the systemic pesticides these days. Um, other controls are there are a range of biological controls the most famous of which is the, the phytocelius mite but on a small collection of, of plants you know the odd house plant uh, it may not be that, that as effective as in a large glass house right i hope you caught all that i will be testing you later but let's have a recap i think the most important element of red spider mite control is what we would call in the business cultural control and that means just changing the conditions in which your plants live in order to ensure that they are as healthy and happy as possible because that way they are less susceptible to pest infestations because pests tend to target plants that are 
are already weakened. And that might be that their the humidity level is too low for their needs or they're getting stressed at the roots because the water supply is too uneven or because the temperature is wrong or because they're in too much light or too little light. So trying to keep your plants happy should help to keep pests at bay. That said, clearly, spider mites can still strike at any plant. And this is where pesticides come in. Systemic pesticides are the synthetic pesticides where the active ingredients are taken up into the plant and its actual system and therefore they're quite long lasting and can be quite effective. However, these are the ones that contain neonics, neonicotinoids. The active ingredient in the one used for spider mites is called acetamiprid. And the reason why I don't use these is I tend to follow organic principles principles in my garden indoor and out and neonics have been found to damage pollinator populations and so I don't really want these in my garden especially as I put my dead house plants onto the compost heap so I steer clear of those but if you do use them just make sure you follow the instructions absolutely to the letter and in fact that applies to any pesticide or product that you're using on your plants please read the label I cannot say that strongly enough there are Pesticides which have organic approval, however, and these usually contain things like plant oils or fatty acids. And these have work on the bodies of the spider mites and basically either kill them or damage them in such a way that they can't continue to reproduce. And depending on what country you're in, you'll find many of these products are available as sprays um, and liquids that can be used on plants. Again, read the label really carefully and check what the active ingredients are. That way you'll know that your product is does not contain any neonicotinoids. There are other products as well, which are often called plant invigorators or plant defenders. And these are quite new to the market and they're a mix of nutrients that the plant needs and surfactants. And, and these just literally reduce the water tension, the surface tension of water, uh, make water wetter effectively and allow the spray to stick to the leaves more easily. Um, and they can help to loosen spider mites and help remove them uh, used in conjunction with a program of spraying and wiping. And in fact, any of these fat fatty acid or plant oil products you can use by spraying the plant um, and then wiping the debris off them. And this is the way that I would proceed really. Isolate your plant well away from any other plants, particularly things like other calatheas that are particularly prone to spider mites and start a program of washing down your plant spraying something like SB Plant Invigorator or Eco-Effective Plant Defender, wiping the leaves, especially the undersides where the spider mites tend to hang out, and just keep doing it. Just keep reapplying and reapplying day after day until all the signs of spider mite are gone. Then a few days later, check again. Check, 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 and you'll find there's probably some more um, eggs there which need removing, and just keep going. If you have any really seriously infected leaves, then sometimes you can remove those completely and give the plant a better chance of recovery that way. Perhaps the most fun way of dealing with spider mites might be a biological control. If I can put it this way, it's a bit like Game of Thrones under a hand lens. So effectively, you introduce one mite to kill another mite. There's a predatory mite that mite that Andrew mentioned called Phytocelius persimilis. And this is the one that's often used to kill off mites, the mites we don't want, the red spider mites. They're introduced into the, the house plant area, usually a big glass house, and they eat away at the red spider mites at every stage of their life cycle and can be very effective in your home, though, where you might have quite a small plant population, as Andrew Salisbury explained, possibly not so effective but kind of fun though. I do want to give it a try. Here's Andrew to explain a bit more about how it works. They do come as, uh, as living animals. Um, so you, you, you throw one of the biological control suppliers up and they send it out and it'll be on, uh, they often come in little sort of cardboard things where you, you peel back a strip or they come in a little sachet that you, you open and, and pour uh, basically vermiculite, which contains the mites on the plants. They do come as living mites and they can get, get going straight away. Uh, but the key with the biological controls is always keep an eye on your plants and spot those early signs and when you do see the early signs of uh, mite damage and mite populations 
that is the time to introduce biological controls. If your mites have got out of hand and your, your plants are beginning to dry up and the, the mites are really causing serious damage, it's probably a bit late then to introduce biological control. And when it comes to neem oil, I should mention this one too. This has become a very popular treatment for houseplants and it's an extract from the neem tree. It is a natural, naturally occurring ingredient. It's not a synthetic chemical, but it's not approved for use in the UK as a pesticide, which is why I don't use it. If you do use it, if you're in a country where it's, it's allowed to be used, please, please, please follow the instructions really, really carefully as you would do for any other pesticide because just because it's naturally in inverted commas doesn't mean that you can fling it around uh, with gay abandon and not take any notice of the instructions. So make sure you dilute it to the right levels and use it carefully. And while you're treating your plant, again, look at the levels of overall health and check if it needs repotting. All of these things can help to just give your plant that extra boost and get it back to its former glory more quickly. One final mystery to solve before we put this subject of spider mites to bed, and that's why are they called red spider mites? Because quite often, if you look at them under a hand lens, they aren't actually red. For, for those who, get, uh, who actually see the spider mite under hand lens, what you'll often see is a, a pale coloured mite, often with two black dots on, on its uh, uh, dorsal surface. Um, and you may then be wondering why they are called glasshouse red spider mite by most of us in the UK, whereas North Americans tend to call them two spotted spider mite, obviously, because of those, those two black spots. Well, uh, a part of the life cycle, uh, particularly when they badly damage plants or when they're going into overwintering, they, the females do actually turn an orangey red. And that's the only stage it's orangey red. Most of the rest of the time, they are that pale green colour with two black dots. And if I can leave you with a final mite related thought, it's this. Although we do want to uh, make sure that our plants are not inhabited by a huge population of red spider mites, mites as part of a huge group of invertebrates are actually really important. And it's really unrealistic if not completely wrong-headed to ever imagine that we're going to get our house plant soil to be free of these microorganisms. Mites as a group, you know, a million species, a single handful of soil having absolutely thousands of individuals in it, you can't really control that. You know, to control that, you would kill the soil. Springtails and mites are almost solely responsible for decomposing leaves into smaller and smaller chunks that make up the soil. You know, without them doing that, without that action, along with worms, we would basically starve, you know, within a year. So, yeah, there's no such thing, I would say, as like clean soil you know these animals are kind of there they're there to stay and i suppose the more we talk about them the more we can view them in a positive light dare i say well that's a great note to end our mic chat today if you want to hear the full interview with jules because he had so many fascinating things to say about non-plant dwelling mites that, that you might find interesting you can do so if you happen to be a patreon subscriber of five dollars a month or more an extra leaf number 30 is up now and you can hear my full chat with jules in that episode and now question of the week comes from Brighton Days on Instagram, aka Charlotte, who wanted some trailing plant recommendations that were cat friendly for beginners, but not too common. Well, Charlotte, I'm not sure if this one is considered to be common or not, but I really love it. And that's what's called Myers asparagus fern also known as the foxtail fern. The normal asparagus fern plumosus, that has an upright habit, but the foxtail fern has a beautiful foxtail-like stem, which once it gets long enough, will start to dangle over and trail. And it looks absolutely lovely and it's not toxic to plants and it's pretty easy to look after. So that one would be pretty high on my list for your requirements. If you've got a really hot sunny spot, then sedum, Morganianum, the burrow's tail succulent. That one is fine for cats and it also would look beautiful in a head pot. I love it when they're displayed in that way so that the stems look like Medusa's hair. Um, that's another great one, but only if you've got plenty of sun. 
It's worth noting that as far as I know, and it's just worth double checking this before you buy, but all of the plants in the genera Pilea and Peperomia are cat friendly. So that includes things like Pilea libanensis, often described as Pilea glauca or glaucophylla, a beautiful tiny leaved Pilea that trails beautifully and is really, really super easy to grow. Uh, I really like that one. And there's lots of peperomia choices uh, for trailing plants too including prostrata. I find that a little bit more difficult to grow, but something like Peperomia quadrangularis, I think that is a super easy Peperomia that's definitely worth a try. And it may not be in vogue at the moment, but I think Scissors rhombifolia, the old fashioned grape ivy, is a grape choice. Uh, <laughs> sorry about that. Uh, it's a trailing plant with attractive looking leaves and is easy to look after and won't kill your cat. And I don't think you can say fairer than that. I hope that's helped Charlotte. And if you've got a question for On The Ledge podcast, drop me a line. My wonderful editorial helper, Kelly, is charting all of your queries in a wonderful spreadsheet. So when I come to my Q&A special very soon, I will be able to answer as many as possible. So thanks to all of you who are getting in touch. Two things to mention before I go. Listener Steve is hoping to organise a listener get together in Glasgow in Scotland. So if you happen to be a Scottish listener, do join the Facebook group Houseplant Fans of On The Ledge and you'll find Steve there. If you just Google Glasgow and Steve, you'll find him or otherwise just drop me a line and I'll put you in touch with Steve. Also, there's a London plant crawl happening on July the 28th. Unfortunately, I can't attend, but it's going to be an East London tour of some of the best places to shop for house plants, including uh, Columbia Road Flower Market. So the details of that are in the show notes, and I really hope that you can support that event. That's all for this week's show. I hope it's given you a new insight into the invisible things going on all around our houseplants. I'll see you next week. Bye! Lonely spire Crawling on the floor Lonely spire Longing for love once more This week's episode was Roll Jordan Roll by The Joy Drops, Insectify by Kid N Nasty, and Lonely Spider by Colour. The ad music was by the Heftone Banjo Orchestra. The tracks were Dill Pickles and Whistling Rufus. All the tracks on the show are licensed under Creative Commons. See janeperone.com for details.